Today, I'm going to be comparing the Tamron 17-28mm lens with the two Sony 16-35mm lenses. Everyone should have a wide-angle lens in their camera bags. I've had one for a while, but it's time to upgrade. And I might have dropped my old wide-angle lens, so I do need one. I want ease of use and portability to be able to shoot the night skies, but also to be able to shoot cityscapes, real estate and landscapes. Now this isn't a scientific test, but a real life one. And what works for me might be different for you. If you want to see all of the images I took, they're available for download in the link in the description below. Both the Sony lenses have really good build quality. They have a metallic body and feel like they're well constructed, whereas the Tamron has a very much plasticky feel to it. In saying that, the Tamron does have a weather strip around the mount, which is really good. The G Master also has this, but the F4 Sony doesn't. The Sony F2.8 is the only one with the extra button on the side. It also has the manual autofocus switch. When it comes to built-in optical steady shot, the Sony F4 is the only one with this. Now the Sony bodies do have that in-body image stabilization. So the other two lenses will be stabilized with the Sony A7 series cameras. They just don't have that extra optical steady shot in the lens. When it comes to weight and size, there's no getting around it. The Sony F2.8 G Master is an absolute beast. And when it's on your camera, you know it. It does add quite a bit of weight to your camera bag and after a day's shooting, you can definitely feel it. It is 680 grams, but it's more the size that makes the difference. The F4 is slightly lighter at 518 grams and it's smaller, but not as small as the Tamron. The Tamron comes in as the smallest lens and it's the lightest at 420 grams, although it does sit nicely on the camera. Putting the 16 to 35 2.8 in the bag was also a challenge. In my Tactic 450 AW, at the bottom of the bag where it's at its narrowest, I couldn't put it face down. And let's be honest, the thing is huge. I had to adjust my bag just to accommodate it. It reminds me of my old Canon shooting days. They are all fly-by-wire focusing lenses, so you won't get the feel of a truly manual focus lens, but you do get the benefits of having autofocus. So first of all, I'm going to look at the astrophotography shots. I haven't used the F4 as this shouldn't even be an option if you're planning on shooting the stars with these lenses. And let's say you're using a tracker. Looking at the shots that I got, I probably should have used a shorter exposure length, especially when I zoom in as the stars are starting to drag a little bit. But I did get up at two o'clock in the morning, so I think I must have been a little bit tired. So if we ignore my flagrant misuse of the 500 rule, even at 2.8 with both lenses, there are no coma aberrations towards the edges of the shots. If you're not sure what this is, check this image from my Canon 50mm f1.4 and look at those bird-like shapes that the stars are forming around the edges of the frame. This is due to poor optics being accentuated at the wider apertures. So going back to the wide angle lenses, they're both really good wide open and they don't show any kind of coma aberrations. Another thing I noticed was that the Tamron produced a slightly darker image than the Sony G Master, but then the Sony did have this strange dark patch in the center of the image. When it comes to vignetting, I've done a quick edit on the next two in Lightroom and we can clearly see they both have bad vignetting. This can be removed afterwards, but it's something to be aware of. On the final set, I've corrected for the vignette and they do produce a good image. However, if you look at this bottom right corner, there is more light pollution and the Sony seems to deal with this a lot better. The Tamron is giving more of a red glow in this haze towards the horizon, whereas the Sony is a lot more neutral. I'm gonna try these two lenses again later in the month when I go to a much darker location. And also, I might actually remember to use the 500 rule properly. So if you're thinking about one of these lenses solely for astrophotography, I'd either go with the Sony G Master or I would scrap these completely and go with a fast prime lens. But for the occasional astrophotography shoot, they will produce some great images. 
Next, we'll move on to cityscapes, and what better place to photograph than the tallest building in the world where you'll definitely need a wide-angle lens. So I'm just going to have a look at a few images here, but I have a whole series of shots in the downloadable folder. Wide open at f2.8, if I crop in at 1 to 1, the Tamron actually looks a little bit sharper than the G Master, and this is really surprising. Then closing down to f8, they all even out, and all three of the lenses perform really well, which is to be expected, although the f4 is not as sharp around the edges. As for chromatic aberration, even though the dynamic range in the shot isn't huge, they all do seem to cope with it well. At their longer focal lengths, both the G Master and the Tamron again are very sharp, and the f4 is trailing just a little bit, but it still does a good job. As for starbursts, both the Tamron and the Sony produce nice results. And again, the F4 has less aperture blades, so it has less of those starburst lines coming out from the harsh lights. If you're not sure about starbursts and you want to learn more, click on the eye in the corner or the link in the description to another of my tutorials. Next, we're gonna look at the landscape shots. These are shot from a tripod and at F16 at shoulder height, everything is pretty much in focus. Although if the foreground was any closer, I'd probably take a few different shots and focus stack them. The center sharpness seems really good on all three lenses. And again, this is to be expected. With the edge focus, if we look to the left at the pylons in the distance on the horizon, they all look pretty close to me. But if you spot a difference, let me know in the comments below. Next, I have the three shots at F8. And by this point, the sun had come out. The foreground is a little bit blurry, so you would have to focus stack with a 16 or a 17 millimeter at this aperture. Again, in the center, they all are comparable when it comes to sharpness. When we look at the edges, both the Tamron and the G Master are very similar, and the F4 is just a little bit softer. Lastly, we get onto the interior real estate shots. I did a quick bracketed sequence for each lens and then blended them in Lightroom. This is a tricky shot as it's so bright outside and that is a daylight white balance light coming in. From the interior lights, they have a warm glow. So it really is a mixed lighting scenario. For a customer, I'd edit these a lot differently, but this was just a quick edit for the video and the DNG files are available for you to download and play to your heart's content. Again, all three lenses coped very well although they did distort a little bit towards the edges. I'd be comfortable in using any one of these lenses to produce online images for any real estate company. But if you really need as much wide angle as possible, I'd go for either one of the Sony's, or if you're solely getting this lens for real estate, I'd get a more specialized lens for the job. Obviously, as they are wide angle lenses, it's a little harder to get the background out of focus, say compared to a 50 millimeter lens but the extra stop in the aperture will help the Tamron and the Sony 2.8G Master. You have to get close to your subject, but you can do it. One other thing is with the G Master, that extra focal range will also help in this respect. And talking of focal length, both of the Sony lenses win in this respect. On the wide side, it's minimal, and I didn't really notice it too much, but when it comes to the longer end, it really is noticeable. And with the Tamron 17 to 28 millimeter, they really have cut it drastically. This is how they keep the weight and size down, but it's quite a sacrifice as 35 millimeters is a really useful focal length. One downside of the Tamron is when you're zooming in or out. This front element does move in and out. And even though it's internal and it doesn't stick out past the front of the lens, I wouldn't like to shoot in very harsh environments. When I was in the desert the other day, I did put a UV filter on it. And this was because I was thinking that the sand might get into this groove and cause the lens to sound really grindy and horrible. And that's the last thing that I want. It's probably the last thing that you want. So if you are shooting in really harsh conditions, you might want to invest in a filter to cover that front up. With the F4 from Sony, it does lengthen slightly, as does the F2.8. So if you're going to be using this on a gimbal, this might be worth thinking about. And talking of gimbals, you may have a problem mounting the G Master because it is so heavy. If you've maybe got like the Zion Crane 2, I think it is, or some of the bigger gimbals, it won't be a problem. But then again, with all of that weight, if you're filming on a gimbal all day, you want the lightest possible setup. 
The Tamron is 7.48 inches, which is 19 centimeters. And both the Sony lenses are 11.02 inches or 28 centimeters. As for the sizes, even though the numbers don't look that different, the G Master does feel a lot bigger. And on the Peak Design Capture Clip, the Sony F4 and Tamron feel much better for hiking, whereas the G Master feels really heavy and it pulls on your shoulder strap. Now I know this is quite a strange title, but you'll see what I mean in a minute. If you're into astrophotography, these lenses will appeal to you. Not so much the F4, but both the F2.8 lenses. However, one thing that really comes in handy is this little nipple on the side marking. Both the Sonys have this, but the Tamron doesn't. It just has this white mark. So when you're kind of fumbling around in the dark, the nipple really helps put the lens on the camera. That sounds really wrong. Anyway, I wish Tamron would put a nipple on it so you can feel where the lens should be without having to turn a light on. With the filter sizes, the Sony F4 has a 72 mm filter, the Sony F2.8 G Master has an 82 mm filter, and the Tamron has the 67 mm filter. Now, when it comes to price, the Tamron wins hands down. At the making of this video, it was $899. The Sony F4 is $1,348 and the Sony G Master is $2,198. And after looking at the image quality, I don't think that there's $1,299 worth of difference in the quality of the images. However, in saying that, it all does come down to your budget. So I went for a walk and took some photos with each of these lenses. And very quickly, I noticed a few things that I wouldn't have noticed if I was just trying them out in the shop. First of all, as I've already said, the Sony G Master is huge, but it actually feels really good to shoot handheld with. And even though it is big, it really isn't that heavy. It kind of reminds me of my old Canon lenses with the size and the feel of it. With the Tamron, it did feel really small and I'd be more comfortable in blending in with the crowd with this lens. However, that loss of those seven millimeters on the longer end does really make a difference and I did miss them. It still is a decent range, but just not as good as the G Master or F4 Sony Zeiss lens. So because of this, I'm really torn. Do I have the practical zoom of the 16 to 35 while sacrificing that weight? Or do I have the smaller travel friendly Tamron and sacrifice the 35 millimeter end? Now, what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. As I've said, I've got all of the images available to download so you can have a look for yourself. After looking at the sharpness and the look of the images, I really couldn't justify spending that much on a lens. I would like to have that 35 millimeter longer end, but I can sacrifice that with a saving of almost $1,300. And also if I need that 35 millimeter end, I can always buy the Sony 35 millimeter 1.8 and I'd still have $550 left to play with. Now, if you want to learn more about photography, go to one of my tutorials here. And if you want to see more on the Tamron, click here for Jason Vong's perspective. And if you haven't already, subscribe for more tutorials. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.